I traveled out to the great state of Texas, to Amarillo, the headquarters of Pot Rocks, the panhandle of Texas Rocketry Society. So how did you get involved in rockets? Well, the first, uh, I was probably, I guess, early teen years. You know, I flew the little Estes model rockets and stuff. And, uh, of course, you know, I kind of lost interest in it, you know, as I got a little bit older. And one day I was on the internet and uh, I can remember it perfect. I was reading about a, an article about, about the weird stuff people sell on eBay. I heard about this Russian submarine for sale and I thought, okay, I've got to see this. And it was in a section, I believe it was called Military Memorabilia. So I saw some rocket parts and stuff in it, just old, you know, fans, airframes, stuff like that. And I got thinking, I wonder what's going on with rocketry these days. So I started searching through the internet, found Tripoli, the website for Tripoli, and noticed they had a prefecture here in Amarillo, and called up Pat one day and introduced myself, and the rest is history. <laughs> I'm treasurer of the club now, and spending a lot of money on this stuff. You know, see if there's either a Tripoli or NAR club in your area. Uh, it's easy to get on the, the internet and uh, look either in the NAR, which is the National Association of Rocketry, or Tripoli Rocketry Association. See if there's a club nearby. Uh, they have phone numbers, email addresses listed for the officers of the club. Give them a call, send them an email, they'll set you right up. You can spend basically as much as you want. Some of the machines you've seen out here are thousand dollar plus uh, rockets going off. Some of the little stuff that, you know, go to a hobby store, maybe spend, I don't know, fifteen, twenty dollars for a kit, a little bit more for the glue and some motors and put it together. So uh, the rocket I'm flying today, it's, uh, um, I got each part I ordered, I ordered most of the parts from one company. It's not a kit. It's all different parts put together, but for all practical purposes, it would be a kit if it was just in a box. But I think my total cost, including the motor and the fuel, probably about $400. I think my favorite part is, is are the people. It, it, these people are absolutely fascinating. There are some real rocket scientists out there, and the you'll you'll run into people that you never would dream could be so involved and so knowledgeable about a subject. Uh, some of these people out here are, they just absolutely amaze me. Flying the rockets for me is a little bit stressful because I'm always worried, you know, if I make sure I've done everything right, I'm worried about blowing something up or tearing something up. But. All right, well, what I'm doing today is I'm assembling a DPS 38 millimeter motor. Basically this is the motor motor tube or the motor case. It's an aluminum uh, um, case that's uh, extremely strong for the high pressure. And this is a motor liner that will go inside the case and then these are <coughs> individual fuel grains that will go inside the liner. And uh, the grain geometry on this motor calls for three four inch grains and two two inch grains with the uh, cores drilled out of them. And the idea is the bigger the core, the lower down on the uh, motor it goes. This is the nozzle end of the motor, so I'll have the biggest cores down here, which happens to be uh, this 5 8 core. I ha actually have one, two, two 5 8 So they'll stack, these two will be at the bottom, this one will be the next up, and then these two half inches will go on top. This is the nozzle end, so they'll stack in there as such. Ideally, you would have a cone. Uh, the in, internal um, core would be in a cone shape, although we have to drill these out, so we, they're going to step down as such. But it has to do with the burn. The, <clears throat> the motor originally starts burning from the top, and it burns down, and that has it it's burning, it's the surface area inside, it's continuing to expand. And that has to do with the type of burn as far as if it's a regressive burn or progressive burn. And I'm not that much of a chemist or a physicist to explain the advantages uh, or disadvantages of, of one design over the other, but 
For the purposes of this particular motor and the particular formulation of this fuel, uh, we're using uh, the sizes I explained earlier. It basically controls the speed of the burn and controls the pressure inside the case. All right, now, so the first thing I'm going to do here is I've labeled the nozzle in so I know which end to load it in the motor. And I'm going to load the, these uh, small half-inch grains are going to go at the top, so I'm going to load them in first and just shove everything one after another. But I'll take a little bit of high-temperature grease this is just a, uh, a type of wheel bearing grease, but it's good under extreme temperatures. And I'll just uh, go along here and coat all the grains up so it'll make it easier to uh, slide it into the liner. And also the little bit of layer of grease helps, uh, it's a little bit of a heat insulator. There's not much grease there, but it, every little bit helps. And in conjunction with that, uh, the phenolic uh, uh, motor liner tube there, it, uh, it does the job, what it needs to do. Because the heat transfer, the main thing about the aluminum case isn't so much the pressure, although if, if you get over pressure it will uh, split, but the heat can also literally melt it. You know, the uh, melting point of aluminum is pretty low as far as metals go. And Today I'm doing a dual deployment on my altimeter. It'll hopefully, if everything goes right, it'll deploy a drogue chute at Apogee and main chute at 500 feet. And this is my first attempt at, attempt at dual deployment. So we'll see how that goes. I'm a little gun shy <laughs> because of the fact that I blew, the last one I blew up. So hopefully this one will be better. I'm a level two flyer in Tripoli and I uh, got my level two just about a year ago at this time. And uh, I, I was lucky. The, the first flight I flew level two attempt, I had a minor separation just before uh, the rocket under parachute before it actually came down to the ground. So I um, didn't get my certification then. The second attempt was successful. And then a few months later, my third flight was when I had my little mishap. So, and we, I haven't flown since then. So now we're going to go ahead and slide the grains in there so we'll start with our smallest grains and work our way up or down as the case may be sometimes these can be a little tough getting in there where do you get these grains well these uh these are homemade our club, we're, um, we're into experimental um, rocketry and we, uh, our, our level two members, a lot of them, uh, we actually uh, mix our own fuel. We have the chemicals and the formulas. And so this is, uh, this particular fuel mix is one of Pat's, uh, Pat Gordzlik's special little uh, touches. That is kind of tough. All right. Tell you what, I'm going to have to go with this bulkhead a little bit just to get a little bit of. There we go. Get over here in the center a little bit. There we go. All right. Now we'll <coughs> grease up the motor liner real good. And this is a good idea to get this thing greased up pretty good because when it, when it burns, this phenolic will char and bake. And if you have it greased up real good, it's a lot easier to get out of that motor case. A lot of people, I know it's Neil's over here, pounding and pounding and pounding trying to get his stuff out so a little extra doesn't hurt anything at all and once again that little bit of grease on on this outside here adds as an insulator a heat insulator and it's amazing you wouldn't think you know a little bit here and a little bit there would make that much difference but it does so and I hope this is gonna fit there we go. oh yeah yeah that's a great fit. Sometimes 
the uh, tolerances between the, the aluminum and the phenolic are off a little bit and you'll either get a real loose one, which you don't want it burning on the outside, or a real tight one, which you just can't get in there. But this one is, is uh, just right. <laughs> if it's too loose, you can burn through the phenolic and it'll start burning on the outside, which totally changes your grain geometry, which basically you're increasing the surface area of the burn on the grain and that's going to cause it to burn extremely fast, extremely high pressure, you blow your, your case up. Okay, now what we'll do, we'll put this little uh, nozzle in here, and as you see, this is a divergent type nozzle that Quentin was talking about the other day. And it's basically the, the big deep end goes up against the grains, and that shallow short end is where the fire comes out. The O-rings seal it, seal up around the uh, the liner here, so that we don't have any blow-by on exhaust gases. Basically, all I'll do here is grease up the O-ring, because what happened on the shuttle was one of the O-rings cracked, and exhaust gas slipped out around it and vented to the outside. When it should have been going down through the nozzle, it slipped around and basically punched a hole, you know, burned a hole in the side of the SRB and that, you know, I believe if, if I remember correctly, and then that just burned a hole like a cut torch right into the uh, uh, main, <coughs> main fuel tank. There we go. Okay. Now I can slip that in. Slide the nozzle in there now with the shallow end toward the grains. And it's going to slide that in there like so. Push it in there a little bit. And now I'm going to put my spacer ring in here, the call thrust ring. And then what I'm going to do is take one of my uh, snap rings here. And I, this thing's actually beveled. It's, flat on one side and somewhat beveled on the other and I want to make sure I've got in there right because the flat side fits up. That sounded like a big one. <laughs> I got to get out there. These snap rings can be treacherous so I always like to put my hand over it like that. Yep, that's what I was talking about right there. Okay, and now all I have to do on this end is basically the same thing. I'll grease up this O-ring. Get your hand so greasy and everything, it's hard to hang on to it. Now, put our bulkhead that also has another O-ring on it. It goes in the top end. Push it down. Snap the O-ring into place or the snap ring in place. Make sure I've got that right. Okay. That's a loaded motor. Basically it's ready for flight. Put it in the rocket, put the igniter in it, and it's ready to go to town. So I want to see it go up, parachute come out, come down all in one piece.
try that again. Like well, it was great up until the main chute didn't deploy, and that I was. Just, one, I think the two, problem is I have to look at when I get it back. Four, but I'm thinking just five, not enough powder in the ejection six. charge, and uh, the chute was in there pretty tight. So next time I'll be sure to wrap that chute a lot tighter so it slides in a little easier. Put maybe an extra gram of black powder in the ejection oh, charge. Oh, that was only. Well, maybe 1,500, 2,000 feet. I always think it was going to go a lot higher than that. You're pretty happy though? Well, yeah, if it comes back in one piece, I'll be happy. No doubt about it. Now, if I was trying for a certification on that flight, I wouldn't have gotten it because the main didn't come out. But the rocket is built like a tank, and I'm hoping it's basically going to be all in one piece and ready to fly again tomorrow. I'll do a little bit of uh, adjustments mainly on the ejection charge and try it again tomorrow.